when you started your business. You had a dream. You had boundless passion. You wanted to create something different. There was a problem, and you were going to solve it. Being an independent retailer is rewarding, but challenging, and there's a lot more to it than you ever imagined. Well, Lightspeed is here to help. With 45,000 customers around the world, we've helped countless entrepreneurs nail the business side of retail so they can spend time doing what they're passionate about. Join us for a six-week speaker series featuring a curated panel of experts that will answer some of retail's toughest questions and give you the edge you need to stay competitive. You have a passion, and we have a passion for technology inspired by you. Visit lightspeedhq.com slash speaker dash series to learn more. Today, I'm speaking with Mark Hardy, the CEO of a company called In Context. How are you today, Mark? Very well, thank you. Thanks for uh, talking with me. Uh, tell me, what is In Context? In Context is a VR simulation company that provides solutions for the retail uh, industry. Okay, and who, which side of the, uh, I guess, this ecosystem do you actually serve? The customers, the shoppers, the stores? We're, we're a B2B platform, so we're serving all companies that are working within the retail ecosystem, from retailers to manufacturers to even vendors of fixtures and other um, uh, sources that uh, retailers and manufacturers would utilize in their go-to-market strategies. Okay, and so what does that exactly mean uh, in the go-to-market strategies? What specific products or activities do you use uh, your software on? So what we allow our clients to do is to simulate any concept that they would have in mind in a virtual store uh, off the convenience of their own PC. And that could involve everything from a macro space, so an entire store redesign or aisle reinvention, down to a micro space, which might be uh, trying new fixtures, new products, uh, signage in the store, or even manipulating uh, the shelf arrangement and changing pricing. So we can allow our clients to manipulate anything from the micro level to the macro level, and then they can actually visualize it at first, and once they decide they want to test that concept, we can actually send shoppers into that virtual store from the comfort of their own home and be able to tell our clients what was the impact of those changes because we can actually tell them sales lift. Hmm. Okay, that's pretty interesting. So you actually are able to let a retailer create their entire store in VR and then a shopper would actually go and take a look at that and provide feedback. It's not providing feedback. We actually allow a shopper to drop into the store okay. and actually shop the store. So we would drop a shopper into the store. The shopper would actually be in the convenience of their own home using their PC they would be given a mission. Uh, they would be first taught how to maneuver in a VR environment. That takes about 60 seconds to, to have that tutorial. And then we drop them into a store and give them a mission. And the mission could be you have $30 to spend uh, in beauty care. What would you spend? Buy or go down the cereal aisle and stock up on the brands in your pantry. And the entire time they're in that store, we're tracking uh, passively all their um, uh, behavior. So what was their path of travel? What was their dwell time? What they pick up and put down? What they pick up and put into the shopping cart? At the end of their shopping experience, they check out. When they check out, we ask them a few questions, which allows us to marry attitudes and the behavior. So what was the ease of shopping? Uh, what was the likelihood to shop there? So we can actually tell you what your sales lift is with a correlation of 0.9 or higher to physical store sales. And we can do that all within a matter of two weeks or less. Okay. So does the, does the software actually have a shopping cart in it so customers can add items to cart and pay for it within that experience? Uh, yes, it does. When they uh, go shopping, they do. But today we are using that only for a B2B application. Uh, so we are taking the data from that shopping experience and we are able then to correlate what was the impact of those concepts or changes that a retailer or manufacturer made in that uh, store. Okay, but if, if a retailer wanted to open that up to the public, for example, they could actually make sales? Absolutely. I mean, we've tested it in the past and we know that we can connect to a POS system 
And we know that in the future, at some point, uh, virtual will be a part of that digital experience. So I think closer in, it's going to be where uh, virtual enhances the e-commerce experience, allowing you to interact and play with uh, products or immerse yourself into that environment once you get into the head-mounted devices, which again, are not in uh, enough penetration enough distribution within households for consumers to be able to use. But in time, a virtual store will allow full immersion and the same experience in a physical store or even into um, custom stores that you may create on your own. So it wouldn't right. have to be typical Walgreens, Walmart, you know, Safeway that you know. It could be something that is completely personalized to you. Right. Okay, and uh, the way that you sell your software to retailers is—is is it like a software as a service model or a, sub, a yeah, like a license model? Yeah, it's it's a software as a service model, and we enable the entire um, enterprise. So uh, we have clients who are using it as a point solution in one department to clients who are, understand the value of the of the software and are using across the entire enterprise, across all the different functional groups. And the value that we ultimately provide is twofold. One, on the financial side, what we're doing is we're reducing operational costs. And we are also able to uh, give you incremental lift because we can assess what's going to move the needle. And we're seeing usually about a 10x return on a financial side. The other side of the equation is speed to market. So what we have seen with our clients is we have one client in particular that in a period of a year uh, looked at about 16 to 18 different um, uh, initiatives and was able to do within a year what would have taken them previously almost three years to execute between uh, uh, thinking through the process and then making a decision to go and testing it in a physical world. So what we're seeing is a huge amount of value uh, that we are generating for our clients, both on the financial side as well as the, uh, as the resource side in terms of time. Okay. Yeah, the speed to innovate is a key differentiator. Absolutely. In today's world in retail, when we're trying to go from what used to be fulfillment centers to experience centers, and every retailer is trying to think about how do they stay relevant in this world, as well as the manufacturers of the products themselves, reinventing themselves and becoming relevant in that world of retail as we go forward, speed is critical. How do you take that idea and understand what the impact of your brand into the shopping experience is going to be? and then be able to take it to market quickly. Right. So um, what is the actual implementation process once a customer signs up? Once a customer signs up, what we do is we then uh, uh, upload all their, what we call assets, which is all the products in their categories. We have the stores themselves already built out. So they tell us which stores that they would like to subscribe to. And stores are the banners. So whether it's a Again, today we are focused in CPG, but we are starting to expand outside of CPG. So it could be a, a Home Depot, a, a Walmart, a Walgreens, and so forth, so on. They tell us which banners they would like to subscribe to, and then uh, they're off to the races. Okay. And um, after, what kind of hardware is required? Uh we have built a system so that it is streaming off of just traditional PCs that uh, and laptops that um, our clients have, so it would be it's no uh, requirements of extra video cards or anything else um, or high-end uh, laptops. So it's just the typical PCs that our clients would have uh, normally for business for day-to-day -day use. However, our platform is also uh, able uh, or is it also enabled on tablets and head mounted devices. So we've been able to integrate and we are agnostic to all the different uh, hardware that exists. So our clients are using the PC to create the concepts. They use the head mounted devices to get full immersion so that they understand what that shopper experience will be at the end of the day. And then when they decide to take that concept to market, they can publish it to the tablets for their field or store personnel. Okay, so when, when the shoppers actually go through to test the concept do they typically go through just the PC experience or the full immersion with the uh, headsets? Today, it's a it's a PC experience because there's not enough households with uh, the head-mounted devices. The interest in the market kind of like ebbs and flows. What do you think is going to take to become a mass market experience? Yeah, I think what you're seeing is, uh, again, people use the word virtual very uh, loosely today. 
So you can take a 360 vis video and they're calling that virtual to actually a full virtual immersion where you're into an environment like ours. I think immersion is a good way to actually distinguish that. So if you take some of the lower end um, devices, which people call VR, like a Google Cardboard, that to me is not a VR experience. It's on your phone. Uh, you're really just interacting. Now, there are applications within there that get a little bit more involved, but not immersed to your point. So when you start looking at them, uh, the devices that allow full immersion, like the Oculus, like the HTC Vive, for example, where you're fully interacting in, uh, with the environments when you're in there, I think what's going to take us to get to that level in a broader sense is when those devices become wireless and a lot of the computing power are in the headsets themselves, right? Because then you are more free around the room. Also, so that the positioning, the positioning tracking is not dependent on light boxes, but they're also in the headset themselves. So I think that from a hardware point of view is the next step, which will enable or um, reinforce that next step in the marketplace of adoption, right? Uh, then when it comes to applications, I think you'll see a lot of entertainment, a lot of gaming on there. That's the natural next step. But what I see uh, from our point of view is the B2B world has a huge opportunity to really accelerate their ideas to market and to tremendously reduce costs um, that they have typically incurred in operating their business. So I see virtual as being that next generation of an operating platform that allows uh, businesses to become a lot more effective and efficient. Okay. Yeah, I mean, retail is definitely changing. Um, yeah. We all see what we see now, but what's it going to be like in 10 years? I mean, could we imagine what we have right now 10 years ago? Not many people probably would. So I'm thinking no. ten, in 10 years... These technologies are going to be a lot more advanced. Hardware is going to be better. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, things we're playing with here evolve everything from on a B2B side allowing uh, collaboration where uh, geography is not an impediment. So you can actually even put a head-mounted device on and collaborate with somebody across the world as if you're in the same room, the same store as they are and start interacting and seeing what they talked about. Down to a B2C level, which I think we will see where the stores as we know them today will become irrelevant because you'll be able to set up your own rooms with the products you care about. Think about it. Even in a typical grocery store has 40,000 products in it, an average consumer only buys 250. So why do I have to sift through all those to get to the ones I want? So why can't I create stores across even what we think of as channels to create one that's completely personalized to me? The way that advertising is going to change to fit into that world uh, is also going to be very significant. Banner ads online will no longer work. It has to be something that's engaging, something that will inspire people to interact with that brand and create a memory from it. So we are playing around with a lot of uh, ideas right now that we're working with some of our clients where it creates that virtual experience and that brand connection and that retail connection, not only for that head-mounted device world, but also for in a digital sense, but also being able to leverage this kind of technology in a physical store. So think about being able to go in a store and when you shop for a product, all you can do is look at the box. And let's take toys, for example. Um, a child goes and looks at the box and, and they can see what the image is on the box. Why couldn't they in a store put on a head mounted device and actually start playing with that toy in a virtual world? And they actually know what it is and then create that uh, uh, closing the loop to a sale by once they take off that hand mounted device they actually know what that toy is they can pick it up put it in the cart with full confidence that that's what they wanted to great way to create memories great way to create a relationship and great way to create engagements between a consumer and that brand or product right yeah that's a good example now uh, you work closely with Intel uh, can you tell me more about the relationship with Intel and how they actually help yeah, Intel's fantastic. As you know, they, they have um, uh, uh, pretty much involvement with companies around the retail space and uh, across the entire retail ecosystem, including manufacturers and, and other large companies. So the, the relationship with Intel, what it provides to us is really um, uh, glimpses into the future of where hardware and software is going and other applications around it. So as we think about our applications, 
we have the advantage of understanding how we can connect into the world that's coming to us. And they connect us not only to the hardware uh, manufacturers and, and new entrants in that space, but also some of the software applications that may relate or may be applicable to what we are doing, which allows us to continuously be on the cutting edge of, of providing new features and functionality to our platform, but also integrating it into the business process of companies, ultimately making it um, more effective and efficient for the companies going from what we do into other areas of the value change that they may um, be concerned about or be dealing with. Okay, so you, uh, you, I saw a couple of the videos and uh, I saw a reference to Intel AI. What is yep. Intel AI? Well, that's the future that's coming. So if you think about the way that virtual allows you to engage uh, consumers as well as businesses today when you're testing out your concepts and your ideas, what you're able to do is collect data that never was uh, available to us before. So in today's world, as you think about it, um, we can capture and report to you on what occurred when you create that concept in virtual reality. When you start integrating artificial intelligence into the platform and leveraging the data that is so unique that VR can provide, it'll allow us to start thinking about creating predictive and prescriptive models, which will allow you to tell you what you should be doing versus just waiting for you to come up with a concept. So I think that's where the impact of AI uh, will have. One of the areas, other areas will be in, uh, increasing the personalization of that experience when it eventually gets to that B2C level. Okay, and Intel is also an investor in the company, correct? Yes, they are. The idea of a, getting a strategic investor is uh, an interesting topic. So what has uh, your experience been so far? Pretty good as far as the freedom to do whatever you feel is the right thing for your product, regardless of really that tie on the investment side with Intel? Yeah, I don't think I could say enough great things about our relationship with Intel Capital um, and Intel because they have allowed us full freedom. They have not only allowed us the freedom, they've actually encouraged it. They are consistently, as I mentioned before, connecting us with new companies and new ideas that allow us to be inspired into directions that we may not even have thought about. Um, so. Uh, the AI question that you just posed, a lot of that also is endorsed by Intel because they know that that's the future um, and therefore they try to expose us to as many companies and startups um, that they can that may be relevant to us. So being associated to Intel has given us uh, what I think is a competitive advantage um, and not just from a financial point of view, but really from a strategic point of view because of the knowledge that they bring to the party. What about AR? I mean, some of the videos that I saw, it seemed like you actually had some kind of a, uh, an AR aspect also to how the store was being designed. Is that a distinguishing factor or how do you distinguish between the two? Yeah, today um, we do not play in the AR space. We are 100% focused on full immersive virtual reality. So. Um, not sure which video you saw, uh, but what we have done before with other partners, and we have played around with some technology too, because virtual reality requires content. And that's what you'll find is at the end of the day, you can design the best software you want, but um, not having content, it's like having a Ferrari in the driveway with no gas, right? And we've built an extensive library of content going from products all the way up to stores and everything in between. So what we are showing, I believe, in the video you saw was the ability of leveraging content as you create concepts in virtual reality and decide to then take it to market because you were able to assess what is the lift or the ROI for that. The ability of being able then to translate that content into other platforms such as AR and being able to allow those technologies to present um, as a way of communication is something that we, uh, we think is part of the future. So it's an integration between VR and AR. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's the exact same platform at this point in time. Okay, yeah, I think the video I was referencing was the, where a gentleman is standing in what seems to be a, a real store and then adding virtual uh. stands and stacking them next to each other and, but now I understand that that's all within a fully immersed VR experience. 
Yeah, actually what you're describing right now is uh, the head mounted device. So what you're seeing is a blue screen video where a gentleman actually is sitting there with a head mounted device and he's in the store manipulating the full store and changing it around while he's in the store itself. So that's not an AR experience. That is actually a full immersion into a store that you're seeing. Okay, but it uses the store's own real physical uh, reality, I guess, as well as a background. What okay. you're seeing on that screen is what he's seeing in the lenses of his ma head mounted device. And what you're seeing him manipulate in his hands is what, uh, as you're seeing him move fixtures around, products around and all the rest, is what's happening on the controllers in his hands in that head mounted device experience. Yeah, that was very interesting. Everybody's thinking that the machines are gonna take over, right? That's going to happen, right? <laughs> I, I'm not sure I believe in that. <laughs> we, we create the machines to help us. Then we expect them to also not innovate, only innovate to a certain point. And so did you heard the, uh, the news about the, uh, the Facebook bots talking to each other in a different language this week and they stopped the experiment? I heard a little bit about it. I did not get fully immersed into that, cover, into that story. Yeah, I think what I'm looking out there, I think the biggest challenge we have, first of all, I don't think that machines are going to replace people, um, right? So I think what's going to happen here is our processes will change. And I think that's the biggest barrier that we've seen today for adoption of this technology is that we're asking people to change processes that they may have done before, right? And the first um, a reaction you usually get from people means it's job loss. And it really isn't job loss. So if you take it down to the lowest level and take it to the store themselves, when you're applying technology like VR and artificial intelligence, you're not eliminating jobs. What you're doing is you're allowing jobs to be repositioned into other roles and responsibilities. So if you think about retailers ultimately going from fulfillment centers where people are just stocking shelves to experience centers, you need ambassadors in that store. You don't need someone necessarily to just take uh, cans and boxes and bags and put them on the shelves. So I think what you're going to see is just a change in roles. And that's all the way from the store itself, all the way up into the management and the decisions that are made at headquarters, uh, both in retail and manufacturers. Because what's going to happen is if you think about, and let's just take some basic data. If you look at trade promotions, Everybody knows it's an industry uh, norm that 70% of them don't produce an ROI. And every time that we touch a shelf, 85% of the time, there's no category growth. If I can give you those insights up front, people tend to pull back because they're used to doing the same programs they did last year, right? And now what they have to do is start investing up front to understand how they are going to make a difference on the back end. And that involves changes in the way that you think. It involves getting comfortable with new data. It means getting comfortable with new technology and changing the process. So I think what you see here over the next 50 years is that you're going to see the companies who succeed are, going, are good at change management and pushing change management. And I think those are the ones that you will see 50 years from now. And whatever that experience may be, will be completely involved with machines, but I don't think they're going to be running the world yet. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, you, you, you actually, that was a very important uh, point. People, habits, fears of that, you know, of change. Uh, and these are things that are a reality for a lot of the new types of technologies that are available now, but are really not being used or implemented. So, but the new generations are growing up with these headsets on their heads or VR on their phones. Do you think we're going to see better adoption just because of that factor with, with the, the newer generations would actually be more inclined to use these things, these technologies? Absolutely. I mean, I can watch our user base. When we have users on our system who are millennials, um, the training for them is probably 15 minutes. And they intuitively get it and they hop on and they're doing things on our system that blows us away, even our best users, because it is second nature to them, right? And I think when you, when you think about companies today, unfortunately, we still have a lot of the previous generation in middle management to senior management, and it takes them a while to think about it. 
And again, back to people's reaction, people think about doing the same thing differently, right? And that is a that is a challenge to some people because they're still thinking about the current roles, the current people, and the current process. So yeah, I think our biggest challenge in VR and the use of VR um, is really around change management. And I do think the new generation to them, it's second nature. So as they continue to move up this, the ladder, there is a natural adoption process there. All right. Well, with that note, uh, we're going to end. Thank you so much. Very interesting, fascinating uh, conversation. And I look forward to uh, hearing more uh, awesome things coming uh, from In Context. Well, thank you very much for inviting me and hosting me today. Being an independent retailer is rewarding, but challenging. And there's a lot more to it than you ever imagined. Well, Lightspeed is here to help. With 45,000 customers around the world, we've helped countless entrepreneurs nail the business side of retail so they can spend time doing what they're passionate about. Join us for a six-week speaker series featuring a curated panel of experts that will answer some of retail's toughest questions and give you the edge you need to stay competitive.